thank the organizers for having <laughs> Professor Ray and Pinaki who have been conducting these uh, meetings. They are uh, really a great opportunity and it has been really, I fortunately I've been part of uh, several editions of this and I've gained immensely because I come here with things uh, in a state where I would like people to give me, uh, make some sense out of it. So I will try to present some part in which I think we understand what's happening. There will be a lot of uh, things in which we are wondering if we are looking at the right things and are we making right inferences. Your suggestions there are most helpful. So uh, thank you again for this invitation. Um, I hope to convince you at the end of this talk that constraint matters in fatigue damage and uh, this particular work has been going on for a while and a lot of students have uh, contributed to it. Uh, currently my student Inijin is uh, doing his PhD on this topic and there have been previous master's students who have uh, contributed in uh, various aspects of it. I will begin with the talk with a disaster and actually two disasters and they are spaced apart by 30 years. And uh, yet, what happened here and there amounts to um, a failure mode in which there was no particular big event, so to say, as in there was no collision with anything, there was no impact uh, uh, or bird hit or any, any event and yet there was such a big failure and um, close to, um, I mean I think some fatalities were there in this particular one, uh, but the problem of fatigue therefore, so it happened because of fatigue and as you can see it is a very dangerous mode of failure because um, repetitive, so many cycles of subcritical loads can cause something as devastating as that. So. Uh, there is no critical load applied and yet after a number of cycles it has become something that could cause this problem. So the minute you were served your uh, people were served their snacks in the aircraft there was this cyclic load that was going on which was not critical and yet it caused so much damage. So there is a lot of um, you know challenges in modeling fatigue because of the number of cycles that are involved. So whatever is happening is happening over 10 to the power 6 cycles, 10 to the power 4 cycles. So the just the sheer magnitude of the data that you have to analyze or you have to ac account for makes it a very challenging problem. And there is lot of empirical data available but predictive modeling is st still something that people are trying. So progressive growth of microstructural damage caused by repetitive subcritical load. So you have cycles of load that are being applied and due to this what happens is there are two main types of mechanisms that are involved. One is formation of persistent slip bands uh, which leads to surface extrusion, intrusion, formation of those at the surface. I will show those uh, subsequently and this causes initiation of a surface crack and this crack when it has formed once you apply cyclic load so you are increasing the load it opens up and it has again some uh, slip activity happening at the two corners of a sharp uh, in uh, uh, sharp uh, crack then it blunts and uh, after blunting so this is the highest uh, load of the cycle and as the cycle load reduces you have again closing of this uh, crack and resharpening of it. This results in formation of striation marks which I believe you have uh, heard in a previous talk on uh, scanning electron microscopy uh, observations and uh, people have been able to even account for 
uh, if you have some changes in the cyclic amplitudes, you can actually count those number of cycles uh, back to what you had applied. So there are very visible um, um, effects of this uh, cyclic phenomena that we are talking about. So this is initiation related. This is what is happening when a fatigue crack has formed and how it grows. So as engineers, we have to be accounting for, we cannot say that there would not be a crack while your flight is taking off because it's virtually not possible to have any material which has no inherent defect. The question is, if you have a starting defect, how it grows during the number of cycles you expect to uh, operate without any incident, that should be accountable. So, now all these mechanisms, as I said, this is um, from 1963, this schematic, but essentially the understanding of these different stages of fatigue uh, failure are, um, you know, uh, well accepted even now. So you have this specimen surface, you have formation, so strain localizes at near the surface due to slip activity, formation of persistent slip bands here. You have applied max, uh, tensile load remotely. This is the specimen cross section we are talking about. And due to this um, slip activity, there is formation of stage one um, uh, slip plane crack surface. So you see a surface forming like that. Then what uh, these microstructural examinations have uh, concluded is that there is a subsurface crack which is referred to as cleavage cracks and um, largely because there is hardly any detectable plastic deformation in these uh, early stages of what is called as say, stage 2 crack. And then what we looked at earlier in the previous slide, you see that now by now the crack is well formed up to here and then onwards you see these uh, you know, these enclaves as they are called here, which is the side view of what you had seen in the top view in the earlier slide. This was the top view and you are looking now from the side so you are, can see those marks uh, uh, of striations. So, and then of course when the crack grows up to a critical length, you have very fast fracture, so that is not so much of interest as is what happens here and subsequently growth. Now if we look at the, a component like this, which is, um, you know, structural engineers would be having, in which the stress state or the stress is not homogeneously distributed, you have locations where it concentrates. Now, you want to be able to tell um, fatigue failure in these initial stages as well as when this initiated crack has propagated further inside. Now, these characterizations uh, for these two processes have been kind of kept separately. So, what is done is the conditions that apply here are uniaxial in nature or rather uh, they are not in uniaxial in nature but to characterize that uh, uh, behavior what is done is uniaxial specimens are created to them we apply different amplitudes of stresses and find out what is the life to failure and in these specimens usually initiation of failure and final failure is pretty quick so, initiation life is pretty much the failure life. No, 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 this is just a... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so, oh, sorry. So, what you have here is material. The, it has a free surface. Yeah, so for instance, uh, in the... Uh, you know, the windows of uh, aircraft, 
you know, so there is a corner there. There used to be a corner there, which was, uh, it had its fillet, but probably not enough. <laughs> so, uh, but these kind of stress raising um, elements are always going to be there. Whatever you design, there are going to be locations which are more critical than the other. So, um, and typically that's where the fatigue crack initiates. And this initiation process, as I mentioned, is uh, better understood uh, by having an idealized homogeneous uh, uh, stresses that are applied in a tensile bar and you are able to get for a given am amplitude what is the life. So if you have higher amplitude you have lower life and you create what is called as stress life approach where you account for this empirical data. This data is utilized in then prediction of that if I have a different, you know, in between uh, whatever uh, stress amplitude, what would be its life. The set of parameters or what is uh, used here and here, uh, sorry, the material uh, parameters that we obtain from these uh, empirical data are very, are not in any way connected with the other empirical curves we generate for propagation of an initiated crack in which we have to first uh, characterize what is the um, crack length. Um, so I have a lot of parameters which I have not uh, made a schematic diagram of so please bear with me. Um, but since that's not the main focus I am putting there but um, I'm sorry that those things are missing. So what I'm trying to argue is that uh, here there is a set of parameters you obtain in uniaxial condition where there was no pre-existing crack and you subjected it to cyclic load. Then there is another way of characterizing is you have a pre-existing crack in a sample and then you monitor if I apply cyclic load to it the rate of crack growth. And that rate of crack growth, DADN, so how much of crack extension uh, uh, per unit cycle, um, how it behaves with respect to another parameter which is stress intensity factor is characterized and this is the famous Paris law which has been used from 1960s to even now for prediction of um, fatigue uh, failure. So, as I said, these uh, uh, parameters obtained here, there are constants, Paris law constants here. Here we have strain, stress strain life approach constants from these material curves. They are apparently not having any connection in spite of uh, depicting fatigue failure of the same material. So what differs? What differs here is that the stress state here is uniaxial compare or has low triaxiality compared to a stress state in front of a well developed crack. What are these terms? I will come to uh, them in the next slide. In, uh, people who know these things, uh, please bear with me in just a couple of slides. So, <clears throat> idea is can we have a model that is simple and accounts for fatigue damage growth here as well as for this. Uh, well-developed crack. Why shouldn't it if we know the stress state for this one as well as that and the material is the same material there should be some connection between these two stages in uh, fatigue growth, crack growth. Yeah. Yeah, so I could just write that there. So essentially what I have um, shown here is a sample uh, which people test there it's called as compact test specimen in which you have a pre-existing crack and then you subject it to a cyclic load and you watch how this is growing right now based on what load you have applied the stress intensity factor is equal to or goes like is what I would say um, the remote stresses that are acting times under root pi A. 
with various constants involved. So, if your sigma infinity is having a cyclic behavior, has an amplitude, for a given crack length, you will have an amplitude of k as well, which is evolving with an evolving crack. For the same applied amplitude of sigma infinity, so you have not changed the applied cyclic load, you have kept the stress amplitude further away, say same. But as the crack grows, the stress intensity factor increases and then it reaches a critical value and it, you know, kind of, uh, the, you have fast fracture. So that is monotonic fracture criteria at the very end. But this process of growth. Because uh, A factor A is Exactly. So from one sample, you are generating the entire curve. Here, one sample is giving you one data point because you are applying the same load. So coming back to, uh, so the idea is can we have a model which can predict both and before we go uh, further, I would just like to uh, describe a few terminologies involved. What we are saying is that the constraint is a parameter uh, which, are, which is going to be quantified with a triaxiality parameter in which we have a ratio between two stress quantities. These stress quantities are invariants of stress transformation. So at, at any point, we have several components of uh, stresses at different planes, and they, are, uh, they make a tensor. So uh, for uh, you know, material behavior, you need some stress invariants. What does this stress invariant have uh, physical meaning? Sigma mean is like what is the hydrostatic component of the stress state? So what is the value of stress with which you are pulling in all directions? And then you have sigma myces, which is like it, ha it is a measure of distortional energy stored um, in the, at the material point. And essentially, it is uh, reflective of uh, the tendency to have plastic deformation. So if you have high constraint, it may be because of high mean stresses or low uh, sigma myces or a combination of these. So um, high triaxiality usually inhibits plastic deformation. Now this constraint parameter, what is its role in terms of damage? So people have studied in case of ductile fracture extensively that the uh, mechanism of void nucleation and coalescence happens at high um, uh, triaxiality. At low triaxiality, in contrast, what you have is strain localization happens first and within that localized uh, straining, you have damage growth and eventual failure because of instability. So as you have localization of strains are more common when you have low triaxiality. When you have higher triaxiality, you have void nucleation and growth and coalescence type of behavior. So there is very well established and there are uh, models in this regard, uh, Gerson Twagard Needleman's model and various variations of that. Now the question that we want to address is, is this kind of dependence on constraint of ductile damage, is it also reflected in fatigue damage also or not? And this is something which has not been given um, much attention so far, only very recently people have started accounting for the, uh, people have done multi-axial states of stress, but the triaxiality parameter playing a role uh, has not been considered. And what we feel is if we account for this dependence on the damage mechanisms, maybe we can capture. Is this correct time going on? 3.30. Okay, so I need to speed up a little bit. So um, the model that we are going to use for the work that we have done, uh, or I, uh, meaning our, uh, 
we have done is using cohesive zone model Anand mentioned about it essentially it is a phen phenomenological model in which this all micro mechanics of void growth and your nucleation and growth is all idealized and what is um, argued is that this happens in a very localized process zone and instead of modeling uh, the micro mechanically phenomenologically what is said is that the remaining continuum behaves like as if there is no damage only this little layer or process zone shows the uh, consequences of damage which is that it is able to sustain uh, uh, the cohesive forces between uh, these this process zone boundaries up to a point beyond which it starts to soften and then lose its ability to sustain any cohesive uh, traction between the surfaces and you that material point becomes part of crack. Now um, this constitutive behavior of the process zone is an assumed form in which you have some traction is a, a function of delta which is the separation between these two surfaces which are essentially idealization of boundaries of these process zone and um, this traction separation behavior usually will have a peak traction values somewhat like this and the area under the curve which is the cohesive energy or the work of fracture and these two are the conventional cohesive parameters for such representation of damage. So usually people say that uh, void spacing is a good measure of the process zone where all this activity takes place. So void spacing thickness is what they call it. Yeah, yes. So unit cell models which have tried to develop these traction separation behavior have taken this wide spacing thickness as the unit cell size to find out how the damage meaning influences the traction separation behavior for a unit cell. I mean experiments, you know, these... Um, I don't know if anybody has done it and yeah that is a lens. Yeah. So there is one book that is coming from a group in France, uh, Henry Pomo. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have measured some of these crack growth mm -hmm. using in situ high energy x-ray system. So they have actually mapped as a function of finding the crack propagation. So that because they have that information, they also have the material information around So they combine the tomography along with the X-rays. Mm -hmm. They actually have the entire material. So that's why they work with it. Okay. So I'm yeah. Okay, so they have looked at the damage uh, process zone yes. uh, constitutive behavior as well. Okay, nice. Yeah, so the now people have extended this model from what I showed for ductile fracture to model fatigue as well and this is also again phenomenological extension is that uh, you define a damage parameter which grows with um, you know uh, number of cycles and if the traction separation behavior for a monotonic fracture was uh, initially um, T and 0 here as shown here then as damage grows it updates itself after some number of cycles damage uh, starts playing an important role and you see that instead of being able to sustain that much traction its ability to sustain traction reduces which is representative of the degradation of properties of the process zone due to fatigue. So there is overall degradation. Now um, what have we done in our model is that this traction separation behavior that we had uh, sp uh, spoken about what are the conventional parameters, 
A stress state dependent cohesive zone, uh, zone model says that uh, these conventional parameters are not a constant. They depend on the stress state that the process zone is subjected to. So, if you have for instance here we have defined an in plane state of stress where only sigma 1 and sigma 2 are acting and sigma 1 is, a, uh, is proportional to sigma 2 and the constant of proportionality is alpha. So, basically a biaxiality ratio. Based on this stress state you can write the triaxiality parameter it would be a function of alpha alone and then uh, we say that instead of traction being a function of separation only, now it depends on not only separation but also the triaxiality parameter such that when alpha is a small value, so you have a near uniaxial tension condition, you get the process zone behavior to be such that it can reach a peak load which is low but the area under the curve is large so it takes dissipates lot of energy but it does not have high strength. On the other hand if we have high alpha uh, condition which is you are pulling in both directions nearly with the same stress then what happens is this process zone can sustain significantly higher peak strength and but much lower energy. So, here we are showing that as you increase alpha, the peak stress can take higher value as per this model. I am not uh, showing the details of the model uh, because uh, that is uh, one kind of story. What we are going to use is this uh, model if we apply to fatigue then what happens, what are the predictions and do we have those predictions reflected in the experiments. So, that is the overall picture that I would like to present. So, um, but the important point here is we take traction separation behavior to be now triaxiality dependent. If high triaxiality, high stress and low uh, energy is taken by the process zone, if the triaxiality is low, the peak stress is low and energy taken dissipated during the work of fracture is higher. And in this we uh, um, uh, take an irreversible fatigue damage parameter which is essentially just a normalized incremental separation. So, we have whatever is incremental separation happening in a uh, part of the cycle. Um, normalized with a length scale and how this length scale is taken to uh, be um, uh, exponentially decaying with uh, triaxiality. What is the justification of that is, is it is connected with back again here. So, this delta naught that I said uh, the normalizing uh, factor that is dependent on when does the softening start. So, as I showed you here the dependence we have taken is that this softening behavior depending on the triaxiality starts earlier and earlier and it is connected with uh, some uh, very well established uh, uh, relations in equivalent plastic strain failure locus for ductile fracture, but for the time being we I am just presenting the form of it. So, <coughs> we have a damage parameter that is evolving, it depends on the current increment in separation, it is normalized with a length uh, uh, parameter which is uh, uh, what you call uh, exponentially decaying with triaxiality. Then we have these two uh, conditions which is essentially that um, damage accumulates beyond a critical threshold and this threshold is on separation and we also have another um, condition on that damage accumulates only for the stresses which are higher than a stress level. The justification for this is to ensure that the concept of endurance limit is uh, uh, satisfied which is that below a certain stress level however many cycles you apply it never ever fails due to fatigue failure. So, uh, these are the 
these are not just by us, other people have used some similar fatigue uh, damage parameters. The only difference is we are trying to use a scaling which is taking into account the dependence on triaxiality. So there are three main parameters introduced here, the threshold on the accumulated separation beyond which the damage accumulates. For any particular increment, if the stress is higher than the endurance limit uh, type of uh, model parameter or not, and the third one is this normalizing. Now in finite element methods, this constitutive behavior is implemented in form of the stiffness matrix for the elements. I am not going into those details. The only things that I would like to mention is that for each cohesive element, I have a neighboring element which provides us with the details of what is the current stress state. So we are using the stress state of the continuum element which is neighboring this cohesive element from the previous step and then using it for finding the traction um, uh, that will happen in this cohesive element for the current state. Also for our uh, the experiments that we do are in a um, uh, large number of cycles are applied for that in thousands. So we do not want to model every single cycle. What we do is we model one cycle and then we say what happens in the next delta n cycles is uh, you know a multiplication of what happens in one cycle. So if after one cycle I had d cycle 1 as the damage then I will say that up to delta n cycles it is d cycle 1 times delta n and then find in the next cycle again what happens and then again do some sort of scaling of course this introduces some level of approximation but we have found uh, for different simulations reducing this doesn't really change the results much beyond a point and then when damage reaches a critical value DC so we have several parameters that are getting introduced and um, but all of such parameters have been used in phenomenology of uh, fatigue fracture uh, or fatigue failure. The question is how many of these parameters we can connect with experimental data and uh, how to go about that. So um, the experiments that we had done were uh, two samples of, um, so we apply 1 to 8 kilonewton here on this sample as I had shown, okay here we have sample. So it has a notch. Uh, at the central here and then we are applying this uh, 1 to 8 kilonewton load at remotely and observing initiation of crack. So this is the crack length and this is the number of cycles, how it changes with number of cycles uh, for 1 to 8 kilonewton. The same amplitude of 7 kilonewton we choose another um, load in a uh, uh, cycle in which 5 to 8 we fluctuate between and we get another curve like this. So this is our experimental data that we would like to simulate and uh, uh, A versus N and for this we uh, do two dimensional plane strain simulations and some details are here. What we have put is the cohesive elements have been put along this path and we have applied cyclic loading and the way I told you how the damage is accumulated and we do predictions of element failure for. For the continuum properties we had done monotonic fracture of the same material earlier and had found out some of the stress state dependent model parameters. I am not stressing on these because that is not the focus. All I want you to take from here is that we found some set of parameters which were able to um, generate fatigue damage data for, um, sorry. So we are able to predict crack growth that happens over 10 to the power 4 cycles. It starts initiating and then goes on to 3 into 10 to the power 4 cycles and it is able to do for both these loads. All we have used are uh, parameters which have no connection with this final curve. 
So many people have used, for instance, the, um, the N uh, cycle to failure or some uh, other uh, uh, measurement from this curve back into the damage uh, uh, parameter. Our damage parameter is all dependent on the stress strain field locally and with no connections to uh, what is happening remotely. So that was the, these were the predictions and uh, we were quite happy with that. But what we found very interesting, so this is the part where I would like to focus is that what we find is that the initiation of crack actually does not happen at the notch surface, but it happens somewhere inside at uh, an element which is subsurface uh, for 1 to 8 kilonewton, it is 0.18 millimeters, so which is 180 uh, micrometers. Now, if I show you the traction history of the elements, you will see that this magenta color, which is actually stress strain reverse, sorry, stress reversals uh, history of the element that is at 1 here. Here, we have all the stresses which are positive high and separations here even though low we have fatigue failure first happening there. So why is it happening because as you saw in the damage parameter high stresses contribute because for every increment the stresses is high, stress is high enough to contribute to damage. Not only that for every separation that we have because of high triaxiality, so that we will see in the previous slide here, sorry, here that, no, not here, this is not the, right, um, it will come subsequently, yeah, that uh, we have high triaxiality, so this is 1 to 8 kilonewton curve in which we are seeing the stress wheel ahead of the notch tip we see high stresses form at the elastic plastic boundary, but we see the initiation occurring beyond the elastic plastic boundary. So for 5 to 12 again, here we have plasticity. The elastic plastic boundary is where you have the peak stresses developing and we have the location of initiation again occurring a bit beyond that. And why this is happening is because if we look at the corresponding triaxiality parameter from the notch tip, at the notch tip, the triaxiality parameter is low because it is traction free surface. As we look the stress field inside, the stress state becomes high, more and more triaxial. So this is more conducive to the uh, growth of damage because the damage parameter has been taken to be normalized with a uh, length parameter that is inversely, sorry, exponentially decaying with triaxiality. So um, if you have high triaxiality, you are uh, normalizing with a very low value of separation and that is making any separation contribute massively to the damage parameter. Now how realistic is this? So this is what we get from the model predictions of a model which takes, uh, gives high importance to triaxiality and all the, you know, dependence have been stated. Now what happens is, so as I said, if I look at the schematic diagram, essentially it says that there is an initiation of a mesoscopic crack here and then it progresses forward as well as backward, but because the stresses here have uh, reduced because of formation of this crack, this backward gro growth is slow and eventually you have formation of a macroscopic crack. And when the ligament has completely been fractured or the fatigue crack has grown completely into the, up to the surface. In the, so this is like from the simulation, the contour plots, this we are showing is the opening stresses. So what is the opening traction? Uh, this is the notch tip ahead of that. And we see that as the crack forms here, the high stresses which are indicated by red color 
are on the right hand side of it. On the left hand side you have high stresses but not as high as in right hand side and this process here is then becoming slightly low triaxiality and here you have high triaxial growth of crack and subsequent formation here all colors have become blue indicating that the surface has become completely traction free. So if I look at here this was initially um, intact and by now you have a crack length of 3.81 here shown. Uh, so completely blue which means it is not taking any traction uh, in uh, the opening um, direction and uh, this is the plastic wake of that. Now plastic wake what does it mean? This is the contour plot of what is the permanent strain left behind uh, even though the crack has uh, progressed ahead you have higher strains here but you have left some permanent uh, strains on the surface of the um, crack. And this plastic wake if we look at for one particular loading case we see that the location of initiation is actually where equivalent plastic strain is very low. So you have hardly any plastic deformation occurring at the location of initiation and this, um, this is the ligament where you have high plastic deformation. And as the crack grows you have more plastic uh, permanent plastic strain in the plastic wake and if I compare the two loading cycles we see that this particular location of initiation in our simulations when we increase the um, uh, mean load uh, it shifts to the right and we have higher equivalent plastic strain that is expected because the overall uh, loads are high and what we see here is this shift of location of initiation as per our model predictions. So um, once we saw this we went back to the experiments and started looking at the surface profile. Do we see any evidence of what people have reported in 1960s of you know those slip lane crack and um, other uh, features are we able to see them or um, and if we are able to see them are we seeing anything more to suggest that a triaxiality based uh, model is capturing something which is actually um, seen in the microstructural examination but not given uh, the kind of uh, you know importance that triaxiality based modeling wants. So let us see the data and you have to tell me whether you are convinced or not. I am biased so I am trying to see more than probably there is. So what we have done is this is the notch tip. So I am drawing here this is the notch tip. You are looking at the fracture surface from the top view here. This is the direction of the propagation of crack. We look at a small little area very close to the notch tip and in this this is the 3D representation of that surface profile. It is a non-contact -op optical surface profiler and this is the notch tip and the direction of propagation of crack is that. And what we see is that near the notch tip actually you have significantly more roughness compared to further ahead. This is for 1 to 8 kilonewton. Then we will do the same type of uh, acquiring data. Here is the notch tip. This is the direction of propagation of crack and we see that again there are very rough surface uh, features or very uh, large undulations of red. Uh, here you have blue, there is red. Here you have blue, there is red indicating there is a large uh, difference in height. Uh, compared to here where it is largely green which is somewhere in the middle. So um, what are these rough regions? Why don't we now cut a few planes and have a look at that. So what have we done here? We have taken the same area and across this thickness direction. So R is representing the distance from the notch tip. T is in the thickness direction. And we have uh, put several bands of um, um, uh, some spacing. Within that band, we average the height 
in the thickness direction and put against what is the distance from the uh, notch tip. So, notch tip is here, notch tip is here and we are averaging the height data in this little width or thickness and then we are putting that as a data point for one curve. So, the curve 1 here represents what is the height variation in this band 1 and in the similar manner we have created some 20 for 1 to 8 because in 1 to 8 we have finer features we did not want to miss and then we have done something similar 1 to 12 for um, uh, the other loading cycle and we observe very interesting features that we do see that slip plane crack that people what okay I will come to that later. Only surface profile if we look we see that there is increase in the deviation in the surface profile up to a point. Beyond that it starts to slowly come back to a, you know a, a very smooth or not much scatter in the uh, height and exactly same way here we see that is the notch tip it is going upward and downward and up to a point this uh, going away from the mode 1 or you know the remote load is tensile here. So, that plane opening stresses are maximum along the 0 degree, but we are seeing these formations which are going up to a point and then coming back to. Now, what we do is if we take for every uh, distance the average height and uh, what is the uh, standard deviation and plot that as a function of uh, the distance from the notch tip. So, notch tip is here and what we see is that it is fairly planar and smooth if I have averaged it across the thickness. So, it looks very rough, but the average is plane and perpendicular to the direction of the remote opening stress. And if we look at the standard deviation, we see an appearance of a length scale where the roughness is maximum. So, if I look at the data surface profile data from 1 to 8 kilo Newton the blue curve up to this point is the notch tip then we see a rise a smooth rise up to a peak value and then this deviation falls back and we see a similar thing in 5 to 12 kilo Newton in which the, the peak has shifted to the right. So, it is happening at a further distance away from the notch tip and it is also having you know what we observe that the roughness decreases. So, what is this length scale and can we connect some make some connections with the mechanisms that have been mentioned in yeah five minutes yeah I am close. So, <clears throat> so what we do now is we looked at a smaller part of uh, focus on the smaller part of the surface again this is the notch tip. Now, we are looking at a distance uh, uh, the maximum roughness distance from the notch tip that we found from the um, the characteristic of the surface profile. So, that is this line. So, we are going along that and observing what is the height variation and I am plotting that here. So, here you are seeing height variations from up of about 0.4 millimeters between the topmost which is um, round about here and the bottom most somewhere in these areas. So, there are regions where the height is significantly different. Now, these regions are not having a very large fluctuation. Um, there are regions where the height is not changing, then there are big transitions, then again there is no change, then there are big transitions. So, as we go along thickness, there are regions which are having very high height and then 
immediately in the neighborhood you have a very low height region and something which is sharply changing the height. Now if we go along the direction of the uh, crack growth which is what was reported in the first few slide I had mentioned about microstructural examination, we do see a slip plane crack type of surface. But we also see some flat regions where we feel are the opening stress dominated uh, fatigue damage growth. We also see and if we see at another plane um, in the uh, uh, similar to that orientation, so this is along the direction we have cut perpendicular to the surface and we are looking at the height profile. We see that this slip plane is not necessarily always oriented upward, it is also going downward and also it does not necessarily extend up to the full length always. There are you know flat regions which could be so large as well. So this is the region of maximum, um, uh, this is the location of the maximum roughness that we were talking about. So what we are trying to say here is that there are probably during those uh, 10 into 10 to the power uh, 4 cycles of initiation, uh, cycles of initiation life, there is lot of activity happening near the notch tip. It is not necessarily restricted to fatigue damage in shear mode alone. It is also in tensile mode acting very close to the surface but subsurface. Why we are convinced about it is because if the uh, initiation were to occur first and then propagation of this would occur, it would not occur at a plane so far away from the plane of symmetry. Also, there wouldn't be sharp transitions between these regions. So these two regions are forming simultaneously is what we are uh, trying to argue and then once one forms the going to the next is very quick. So let's see whether we are able to see and then this so this initiation process is not from uh, sequentially from the surface to up to here we are saying that in this particular region there are multiple or rather more than one um, uh, modes of fatigue damage growth during so many initiation cycles and then it is complex how it progresses um, it may be locally progressing even backward as we have observed. So very close to the this is the uh, region of maximum roughness we are going in this direction in T this is R and you can see that there are formations so we have highlighted them so we have tried to highlight them with very faint lines so that it does not interfere with the actual topographical features. Here you can see probably more clearly that there is a formation of a plane here and then you can see that the progression lines are actually moving backwards towards the notch tip. So the slip planes have uh, shearing mode of fatigue damage growth and there are regions which are planar also subsurface never on the surface. So why this happens is because these uh, near the sub -sur uh, near surface you have low triaxiality which encourages strain localization like we have seen even for ductile fracture you have slip based activity taking place but stresses are higher subsurface triaxiality is higher subsurface so if fatigue damage is dominantly due to triaxiality you will observe a subsurface uh, planar region which is um, in uh, opening mode and so that is the summary um, I think this is uh, so what we are trying to ask in the end is we have a model with which we get predictions of subsurface cracking. We look back at the data 
uh, sorry, back at the samples uh, for this uh, uh, fatty crack uh, growth and try to identify are there any features that seem to be connected with high triaxiality events and are these length scales that we are seeing in experiment that is the maximum roughness and the length scale which is the location of initiation and model are they in any way connected or what will convince us because measuring in situ fatty crack initiation which is subsurface at uh, 180 microns is very hard to do. People have started doing for very low cycle fatigue. They are able to see subsurface initiation, but a corresponding some data which probably from uh, acoustic emission or something else in which we can identify initiation of subsurface cracking uh, would be something that would be, uh, you know, uh, a challenge, but probably worth looking at as well. Thank you for your kind attention and any questions. In front of the notch, you mean? In front of the notch. Yeah. So that is what we are trying to argue that this uh, growth of, uh, you know, a fatigue crack, which has been uh, broken into stage one and stage two with clear demarcations. We feel the early stage one, stage two is part of stage one. Stage 1 and early stage 2 happening simultaneously, which precedes the other is not clear because otherwise you would have seen a consequence of growth. So, if you have a zigzag growth, so if it grows like this, it should try to come back to, uh, you know, the plane of which happens in an overall average manner. But if I look at specific planes, then I see that there is already a flat surface, a slip plane has formed there and then suddenly they find existence of each other and there is a sharp joining of that. Now once you have a well formed crack, then it progresses sequentially towards the propagation direction. But this initiation process which is only attributed to slip plane activity is perhaps not it's it's microstructural examination based it is not mechanistically possible that high opening stresses as well as not allowing any form of dissipation like you are saying which is high triaxialicity associated with will not lead to damage growth the other evidence which motivated us in this direction was that if you see a fatty crack it actually progresses with its front in the middle. So there is some sort of a tunneling happening. So it kind of drags at the surface, the center of the crack progresses front. That is the location of highest triaxiality within the thickness direction. So that is also a manifestation of the fact that high triaxiality is conducive to uh, fatigue damage growth. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, the GDF, hmm. and this cycle is over the and it's supposedly going to fail at some point. Yeah. Is the circle roughness a good indicator that this is where I can stop using the material? Um, so, not really, because surface roughness does change, but you know, different materials, this extrusion that I showed doesn't happen in all materials. So, you know, how 
uh, yeah so so um, um, if I understand what you are saying is um, if you are boarding a plane I want to feel safe yeah, and what yeah, should no. what should I <laughs> be trying to characterize so what you should be trying to characterize is that your device should be able to tell you that I can measure anything of this size and higher so any crack which is measurable it should be visible or there are these NDT measurements non-destructive testing measurement techniques which can measure maybe the potential difference around uh, you know virgin material and non which has been subject to cycles so it is actually visible crack so one kind of crack that I know of huh. going on in a railway it's about that it's probably like fan shafts yeah Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so clearly it is not fully, I mean, as you can see, even now, there are a lot of accidents that do happen. I mean, not a lot, but uh, there is a predictive, so these materials have been characterized that if you have this particular crack length, which I can measure for sure and a lot of detection is actually by looking <laughs> you look for no not roughness it is no no he's saying yeah a visible crack on the surface so you know as I mentioned the surface actually is the last to initiate the crack so if you have a thick specimen it actually grows at the center first and then it progresses like a small ellipse, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, those are those are not. Sorry. No extrusion doesn't happen very prominently, so you can't go by characterization of extrusion. Yeah, also the local surface roughness may induce extrusion, may not induce. So those plastic slip based events actually have uh, high dependence on, you know, grains and, you know, the microstructural details. So just, you know, there's a void nucleus in the material. Hmm. You can't really detect it from outside. Yeah. Um, what you're saying is, if there's a crack nucleation, yeah. is there some manifestation of the so what the Paris law does is Paris law based defect tolerant design it says that if you have a certain crack length it can take so many cycles of the operational load that you expect and before that nothing will happen which is of consequence <laughs> yeah and and actually why I had put these two particular uh, disasters is because firstly the factor of safety so when a f a aircraft has to fly so the mass has to be reduced to the extent possible to save fuel make the you know all these uh, issues can be avoided but what gets compromised is Yeah. Thermal things you have to do in situ. So while it is happening, it will have some thermal signal that will. But sorry, huh? Sorry, sorry. Sometimes just by doing it, you might make that the difference and actually create heat inside. Hmm. Yeah. So if this crack, if you open and close, open, so many Well, um, the kind of analysis we are doing, we are not accounting for those. Um, huh? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
one fly cycle is one cycle. no 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 one flight has many cycles it's the vibrations it's the vibrations we are talking about so you have one operational load and it's fluctuating around that and even the things which are rotating for instance so they are having their you know rotational yeah Uh, yes, yes, uh, that is correct. That is correct. I have a very nice question. Yeah, 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 please. So, given that the number of time of uh, aircraft, so, huh. kind of, uh, kind of landing <laughs> and taking off, so how much inspection time is possible to actually see this kind of failures are happening? So, you might have some interactions with airlines in this. Case. I do have interaction with people in G, but I think they are also, I mean, I have not asked this specific question because. I don't want to be worrying about whether that fellow has done his job properly or not because I will tell you people who start studying you know fatigue and in my lab I put these number of cycles a nice uh, you know uh, intact specimen eventually is developing this crack which is growing in a and you can't observe it so easily also I mean beyond a point it becomes so it is frightening to see that. To see atomistically sharp cracks growing at, you know, uh, and 10 to the power, uh, the four cycles is nothing if it is a, as she said, which component you are looking at within a flight, there will be some things for which, you know, the component probably the starting and the landing are the two events. And there are other components, uh, like for instance, the wheels when you are, so that will be takeoff and the landing, which will be the events for that component. But there will be other components in which it is uh, many more in a single flight. So the inspection is also tuned to that. Yeah. I was not understanding your answer, but what, why you say that you can use these ultrasonic uh, measurements here? Ultrasonic measurements, you know, you can use, NDT uses, but, uh, you know, if you have one single critical point where to expect it to grow, it is possible to have that ultrasound, otherwise, you know, you have this infinite, you cannot scan, you can, you can scan, yeah, yeah. That's where people are tomography, there are some, sometimes you cannot use it if it's some military stuff. Yeah. But ultrasonic has no problem. Yeah, so there is a tomographic ultrasound which can recreate the entire Ah, it's ultrasonic. Yeah, it's ultrasonic. It's like the one you do the CT scan. Yeah, body imaging. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. It's something like that. I understand that. But I think there's another issue there. It's a time that takes. Yeah. It's it's very large. The the whole. But for example, when they do the railway system, they scan the rail like this. Many kilometers. Yeah. And this machine goes there and tests for, for the crack. Yeah, but the component, if you see the railway track, has a very well defined geometry. You can roll things over it. But in where you have convexity, and you know, so all those issues also play into the structural integrity. But they also do this, this uh, test. Yes. Yes. So what happens is rubber polymerizes over time. This is why there's a cracks. Rubber has got to do with crystallization as well. Crystallization of the rubber. So are there phase transitions here? A structural phase transition? Some kind of I don't know what. What is the analog of of a rubber crystallization in this particular problem? I don't know, but you have an alloy, right? Yeah. And the alloy is constantly going up and down. Just is there some like some sort of an aging type of no actually phase transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Process zone. Yeah. 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 You have a localized phase transformation, which leads to increased volume. The phase that forms actually has a higher volume. Okay. That blunt is a crack. Okay. 
and that actually gives toughness to the ceramics. That's from my undergrad to previous days from 15 years back. I can, that's what I can recall. But otherwise, these kinds of alloys <coughs> There is some permanent deformation that is left behind, but no, you know, change in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.